Okay, so for everyone online so far, we've got 63. We're just turning seven o'clock, which is the official start time. We actually have 204 or 40 uh, registrants. So it's gonna be a big night. Um, so clearly we're gonna give a little bit of time for people to crowd in, you know, get their masks on and crowd into the room, find a chair, all that kind of stuff. Um, but probably by 7.05 at the latest, we'll get started. All right, we just increased by 50% to 92, so good pace. Boom, broke a hundred. Okay. Oh God, I just realized I was well, not on mute and you all heard me eat my dinner. Oh my God, sorry. Um, 
Well, all right, so here we are. We're at 115, five minutes in. I think we'll get started. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to a, another um, <clears throat> event from the Ballot-Kinwood Library. As we get started, I'm just going to remind you of a couple ground rules, but I got to say, a year in, we've got this. Everybody's muted, doing a good job. Um, so that's awesome. If you do come off mute during the call, I will mute you just to, for the benefit of everyone else. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end of the session, and uh, we can certainly do a, an oral Q&A, but a really good way to get your question into the queue is to, if you're on your computer, to mouse down to the bottom of your screen. In the middle, you'll see a little dialog balloon, and underneath it, it says chat. Click it and just type away. In, the message box is in the bottom right and type your question there. We'll hold all questions until um, Jerry's finished presenting and then uh, we'll go through them. And again, if we, anyone wants to also call one out orally at the end of the, the session, that'll be fine too. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jan Janet Michelson Gibriahu the coordinator of events for the board of directors of the Ballot Kingwood Library. Janet, sorry, I, I may have muted you too. My fault. Okay. There you go. Unmuted myself. I, I'm Janet Michelson uh, and very excited to welcome everyone to this, which probably will be the last presentation in our lecture series this year. Um, and the most well attended of, I believe, any session that we've ever had either in person or in Zoom, which I think is a testament both to Jerry Francis, who is our lecturer and a very well loved lecturer uh, in our series and also to the relevance of Jerry's topic. Um, just to give you a little bit of an idea who Jerry Francis is. He's a retired business, business executive who is in the information technology industry. He has a degree, a master's in library science from Villanova. His wife of 49 years, Denise, uh, was the reference librarian at the Ballot-Kinwood Library for 17 years. So Mrs. Francis was well known to many people who came into our library. Um, uh, Mr. Francis is currently working with a number of local nonprofit organizations, including the Historical Society, the, Mer the Marion Community Association. He's a trustee of the Lower Marion Academy. He's an author, a lecturer, a librarian, a website manager, and a business manager for a number of publications. Um, and he's been an active participant in a variety of historical preservation projects. When I looked at his list of volunteer activities, it put us all to shame. He was the person who, one of the people or the person who conceived of the Kinwood Heritage Trail and worked very hard with the people who organized um, the Kinwood Station Revitalization Project and the establishment of the and maintenance of the trail itself. He's been very active with the Boy Scouts of America. He's a senior volunteer in Montgomery County. He's a Freemason, he's active in his church. And so much of what I know about the history of Lower Marion, of the neighborhoods of Lower Marion and of the area I give credit to Jerry Francis for introducing me to the beauty and the excitement of knowing our, our, uh, our own history. So with that, I'll give the floor to Jerry Francis. Uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, uh, as you know, I, I'm, the, I'm associated with the Lower Marion Historical Society, which is just nearby, it's at the, uh, located at the Lower Marion Academy. The motto of the Lower Marion Historical Society is preserving our past for the future. Only by knowing the past can we understand the present 
and mold the future and thus make and thus make the most of our brief histories. My presentation will be similar to the approach that James Michener used in his book, The Source, published in 1965. Namely, um, he took a history of just one location, which is a tell that was in the Holy Land. For our journey back in time, we will use the Lower Marion Academy as our primary focal point. Many of the sources for this presentation came from the extensive collection of the Lower Marion Historical Society. Unfortunately, you know, due to the pandemic, we are closed. Uh, we are um, hopefully we'll reopen Wednesday, June 2nd for the general public. So you can come and see what we have. But in the meantime, uh, uh, stay safe and healthy. And we're getting our volunteers to make sure they're properly vaccinated before they deal with the public. I will now take on the role of the Historical Society's reporter. And we'll share with you some historical facts about our community's legacy. I will try to maintain, I will try to remain objective and not cloud the events with my personal views, my life experiences and my learned biases. Okay, let's get started. The journey uh, and set the stage that if you go back in time. When I was growing up, when they took history, it started with the white European male. It's not true. There were indigenous people here before we arrived. So history is about people these people successfully lived in our area, believe it or not, for more than 12,000 years. Due to the change in climate and landscape, archaeologists have divided this early history into four distinct time periods. They are the Paleo-Indian period, which is about 10,000 BCE, um, before the Common Era, to about 8,000 BCE. I call this the arrival. Uh, this is when the... Uh, um, this was a, a, the migration period where uh, the uh, Native American uh, moved in, into this, into North America coming from Asia and from Europe. These people lived on high ground and were uh, for self-protection uh, from the wild animals that roamed around in the open prairies. Next came the archaic period, 8,000 BCE to about 1,000 BCE. They are now living uh, on the rivers and streams. We were hunters, fishermen, and food gatherers. Next comes the Woodlands period, which is 1000 BCE to 1550 CE, uh, it's a common era. I call this the village people. Uh, the development of agriculture led to the development of a culture uh, that led to an identity, uh, what is today known as the Lenape people. They had a myth mythology based on nature and their story of creation was centered around the turtle. They were of the Turtle Clan. Uh, this is, um, that was their equivalent to our story of, of, uh, of a book of Genesis. Well, it's not moving. Oh, come on. Um, why don't you, so you're working on a Mac. Why don't, can you put it into, put, click on slideshow? I, on I, your screen? Yeah. It worked a few minutes ago. Uh, you, so it might, it might be, is it showing on a different, do you have two screens? No. All right, um, why don't you unshare your screen? So you say share it again. Paul, share? Yep, stop, yep. stop mm -hmm. sharing. There you go, now share it again. No. Okay, so now we see, oh, so, all right. <clears throat> um, stop sharing. Um, click share your screen and select your desktop. It should be the one at the top to the far left. You probably see your face in it. All right, now, uh, is it you have PowerPoint, right? Yes. 
Go down, go down and click the PowerPoint, the P, the bottom. There you go. And try slideshow again. So the technology here. <laughs> Okay, tell you what, um, uh, click slideshow again, please. Go ahead, click that. So the, click slideshow again. There you, there you go, click that. And How about go, go to the very top menu bar, click slideshow there. Yep, that's it. Let the, get the menu to drop down. There we go. You're a genius. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right, okay, there we go. That's our Lower Marion Academy, uh, where our headquarters is, and that's gonna be the focus point of the uh, talk this evening. Um, the Sorry, Jerry, I'm gonna interrupt one more time. Yes. Can you maximize your screen? The green button that's usually all the way to the left on the Mac? I don't know where that is. This is good enough, I think. Okay. All right. Go with it. I don't see any green button. Oh, there it drag is. that. There you go. Hit the green button. Boom. What does that do? I just, it fills the screen. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, we got through that. <laughs> um, the Lenape's creation theory is uh, they're, well, equivalent to our book of Genesis is uh, something called, um, uh, the world was created on the back of a turtle. This is a tree sculpture that we have in the Kinwood Station Park of the, tur what we call it the Turtle Island uh, sculpture. It's about the, uh, um, how the world was created according to the Native American. The creator brought a giant turtle from the depths of the great ocean. A turtle grew until it became the vast island known as what we know as today, as North America. The first woman and the first man sprouted from the tree and it, on a turtle's back. And it goes on and on and on like that. But the important thing here to look at is in their th culture, the woman was created before the man. And we want to keep that thought in your mind as we go through the uh, Lenape history. Uh, Lenape belonged to the uh, Algonquin nation. Uh, they, 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 uh, they were of the Lenape tribe or uh, original people they were called. Uh, Europeans referred to them as the Delawares because when the Europeans arrived here uh, as uh, explorers uh, back in the uh, late 1600s, they were explorers from Jamestown, Virginia, and they named, they had this river, they didn't know what to call it, so they called it Delaware after Lord Delaware, the uh, second governor of Jamestown, Virginia. And they saw these uh, Native Americans in their canoes along the river and they didn't know what to call them, so they just called them Delawares. But they're actually, their proper name is um, Lenape. Uh, they're of the Yanami clan, uh, the Turtle clan, and uh, they belong to the Schuylkill River uh, Basin Band. So they were uh, uh, lived in our immediate area around here in Lower Marion. They lived in wikiups and foraged and hunted for their food, moving their encampment according to the season of the year. The village life centered around a society that was matriarchal, matrilocal, matrilineal. Life uh, was Life revolved around the importance of the female who, was, who were life makers while the male were considered life takers or hunters. Next was the contact period. Now this is where we get interesting. Uh, this is from 1550 CE to about 1800 CE. Uh, this is the, uh, um, when the uh, European arrives. Uh, this is a little uh, picture we, uh, was done. A lot of my research I get from a Dr. Marshall Becker. He's the, uh, uh, in the archaeology department, anthropology department at Westchester University. This is a sketch that he commissioned of what it was like during the contact period with the European arriving and also the uh, 
uh, mixture of the uh, Lenape and the Susquehannocks, how they probably would have dressed. So this is probably what the, the contact period would have looked like. Europeans now arrived. They were called the, uh, the salt men who came from the great sea. They were Swedes who wanted to make a new life here and to, and to settle. The Dutch wanted to make a profit for their investors. And then, and then in the, and, and by people of Finnish and English descent, uh, in the 1630s, uh, when the Dutch arrived in the mid-Atlantic region, um, they were responsible for the importation of enslaved people into the local population. For the Lenape in the mid-Atlantic region, contact with the Europeans was unfortunate because they did not have the immunity from, from, from such ailments as mumps, measles, chickenpox, etc. But then there was an occasional smallpox epidemic that was introduced by the Swedes to uh, uh, kind of eradicate the Dutch. It was intentionally uh, introduced into their population. Uh, I call this kind of like an early biological warfare. Because of Lenape's weak immune system, uh, approximately 80% of the Lenape in the mid-Atlantic region uh, died before 1700. Of the more than 24,000 native people, fewer than 3,000 Lenape survived the epidemic. The event can be characterized as a Lenape pandemic, common word today. Fortunately, because of the remote location of Lower Marion, our local Lenape population was spared of the, from the smallpox epidemics. It is estimated that there were around 300 to 400 Lenape living in the Schuylkill Valley Basin area. In the immediate Lower Marion area, it is this estimate it was around 30 to 40, or approximately 40 people. So it was a small population. We're not in the mainstream here. Uh, we're out in the country uh, away from the uh, Delaware River. As a librarian, uh, anytime you do anything, I have recommended reading. <laughs> uh, if you want to learn more about the contact period, there's a wonderful book uh, written that is called A Lenape Country, Delaware Valley Society Before William Penn by Gene Sutherland, S-O-D-E-R-L-U-N-D. I'm sure you have the book at the Balakinwood Library, but it's worth reading if you want to learn more about this uh, uh, stressful time when the um, um, Europeans meet the Lenape. I want to change topic a little bit um, and talk about our Swedish trading post. Uh, it is believed that history is sometimes a little swampy. Um, uh, that in 1654, the Swedes established a trading post at what is today Shady Lane uh, on Montgomery Avenue in Narberth. At this log cabin, the Swedes traded with the Lenape and the Susquehannocks and for, for beaver pelts and for trading goods. We think of the Jews as late arrivals in this area. But it is, there is a saying, an absence of evidence is not an absence of fact. And there is some evidence, fairly good evidence, and we're putting it together, that as far back as 1655, there was Jewish fur traders traveling through our area, believe it or not. It is alleged, or the history of it, because it's, you know, record keeping was um, inconsistent that there was a gentleman, two gentlemen by the name of is Isaac Israel and Benjamin Carduso were Spanish or Sephardic Jews from Portugal who, who fled the Inquisition and sought refuge in the Barbados. Due to Isaac's and Benjamin's willingness to explore southeastern Pennsylvania, which included around and near our area here in our trading post, Isaac and Benjamin may have been the first Jews living and working here in Lower Marion. So these two fur traders may have had the presence from 1655 to 1675 or 27 years before the arrival of William Penn. So uh, it's, yes, they were uh, quite a mixture of people in the early, early, early days. Okay, we, we really can't talk about Lower Marion uh, unless, uh, without starting with the Quaker William Penn who sets the stage for most of our history. In 1682, William Penn arrived with the vision for his new colony that he, that he referred to as his holy experiment, a secure and peaceable haven for people of Europe who were persecuted for their religious beliefs. 
Initially, the peace-loving Lenape got, uh, got along with the peace-loving Quakers. Uh, both groups believed in the principles of justice, peace, religious freedom, and the respect for people in different uh, backgrounds. Here's the uh, picture of the uh, Peace Treaty Monument, which is uh, located on, on uh, North Beach Street in North Philadelphia. Uh, this is where William Penn um, um, signed the Peace Treaty. Um, tradition suggests and was memorialized by Benjamin West that the treaty may have been signed here in 1683. It's more of a tradition, but so it's a wonderful tradition. Uh, and it's lasted for, until 1737 or for 54 years until uh, the walking purchase happened. And it was also known as the big land swap uh, or swindle. The monument reads, while other colonies were in conflict and in great distress, with the Indians, William Penn, through his philosophy of social justice and peace, engaged their friendship and goodwill. But there were differences between the ways of life of the Lenape and the Europeans that made it difficult for, for them to blend their populations and to reach a permanent common understanding. Just a few examples why they really could not, over a long period of time, coexist. Uh, Lenape had a uh, a harmony with nature. They got along with nature. Uh, the European wanted control over nature. Um, those, you know, we're, uh, the way we practice religion today, there's a special house of worship in that house, be a church, synagogue, mosque. There's a special place, might we want to call it sanctuary. So uh, for the Lenape, the, their sanctuary was nature. Everything around them was this important to them. They required respect. Well, the Judeo-Christian tradition of Genesis, in Genesis, it talks about God's command to rule and have dominion over nature. Also, um, for the Lenape, women were the primary decision makers versus the European who did not recognize the woman as the leader and as a decision maker, only recognized the male as their leader. And also Lenape had a declining population and the European had an increasing population. And more, European, and more Europeans continued to arrive. There was also the influx of enslaved people from West Africa who arrived on ships from the, to the port of Philadelphia. This human cargo was moved to the London coffee house that was located on Front Street and High Street, so where they were Africans were inspected and then purchased for public sale. Penn was also concerned about the treatment of the enslaved people in his new colony. But for a short period of time, Penn himself had 12 slaves, people who worked building his country house uh, in Pensbury Manor located along the Delaware River. The search for religious freedom and escape from war, famine, poverty, and difficult living conditions continued to drive people from Europe to North America. Along with the migration of additional English, there were other new newcomers who were fleeing Europe. To name just a few, there were the Germans, the Scotch-Irish, and the Welsh. There's the old familiar Mary meeting friends meeting house. Let's now talk about our uh, Welsh Quaker friends. Mary Friends Meeting was located along the Allegheny Path, what is today Montgomery Avenue. It is presumed that this site had been previously occupied as a Lenape encampment. And when the Welsh Quakers arrived, they selected this strategic location as a gathering place and where they built their meeting house and also we had hopes and aspirations to build their wealth sparing. As you go through here, I'm gonna have a lot of uh, uh, historical landmarks, uh, roadside uh, signs, because um, they tell a story. Here's the Marion Friends Meeting House. It's a national historic landmark. It's, it's, it's way above national register. It's, it's a significant building. 
This meeting was established by the Marianist Welsh community who settled the area in 1682. Completed in 1714, it is important for this association with the earliest settlement of Welsh speaking people in the New World. It's nice to have them in our neighbors up the street. Today, the religious society of friends are Hicksite, a more liberal branch of Quakers who emphasize the inner light, and they have an unprogrammed meeting and tend to be concerned about social justice issues. Very few members of the Lower Marion community own slaves, people or, or indentured servants. Enslaved people were considered property, and as such, when land was transferred to a new owner, the enslaved individual and the indentured servant was part of the land swap. In our archive collection, we find just one instance in practice. It is from 1703. It's a very early time. Uh, it qu I quote, uh, I'll just deed transfer. And in full, for my share of a Negro man named Peter, and for uh, my share of a Negro woman named Hannah, and for my share of a servant lad named Samuel Thomas, who is to serve until he attains the full age of 21 years. Uh, this is a transaction between um, Catherine Thomas and uh, Cadwater uh, Jones. Okay. Uh, in the Penn Valley area today, 1703. So that's the only case we can find that they were, uh, I said, the, there weren't that many enslaved people here. I wanna go back to Lenape. The Lenape's diaspora. Tradition says that around 1740, the few remaining Lenape from our immediate area gathered at the Black Rocks and uh, by Dove Lake you know, along meeting uh, along Mill Creek Valley. This location was a source of church. They quarried that it was a flint-like stone used to manufacture spear points and arrowheads. It was here that the Lenape uh, Lenape band uh, decided that they were to leave the area and when they broke camp they migrated westward. They vanished from our landscape. Since then there has not they since then there has no voice for these people in Lower Marion. They moved out. They couldn't put up with us. Can you imagine they were used to living amongst their own nature and these Europeans arrive and they all spoke different languages, uh, Welsh, English, German, um, Swedish, uh, so on and so forth. And each one had a different religion. So they, they just they found the people from the Great Salt Ocean were very confused <laughs> and they just couldn't you know, uh, line up with them. Today, the remnants of the Lenape community can be found on Indian reservations located in Anacardo in Western Oklahoma and in Barksville in Northeast uh, Oklahoma. These two groups are recognized by the US government and by the state government as Lenape, by, uh, by as true Lenape. A few groups decided to stay in the Delaware Valley and others scattered throughout the Toronto region of Canada. They just dispersed. There's a splinter group located in Eastern Pennsylvania area and they claim to be Lenape by way of blood quantum the Indian blood laws based on percentage of ancestry. Now we're a farming community. We have now stripped away all the forest trees and now we have <clears throat> transferred into farmland that serves the purpose of being the food basket in the near Philadelphia. Hey, Jerry. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you, it's Michael again. Uh, we're seeing slide seven of 26. It's still the- Marion um, Friends? National, it's still the National Historic Landmark thing. There yeah. you go. Okay, yeah. Okay, I'm go Is that where you wanna be? This one. Harrington House. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. They're not evenly distributed. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, we stripped, we stripped away the trees, uh, et cetera, and we were transformed into farmland that serves the purpose of being a food basket for the nearby city of Philadelphia. With herds of, of 
livestock, a variety of farms, and the Mill Creek Valley we're with, with water-powered mills to process and to manufacture various items, such as cotton fabric, paper, gunpowder, and other necessities. Yes, there were enslaved people working in some of our mills here in the Lower Marion. Slavery is a complicated topic and deserves its own lecture. But, to, but for today, the, here are some simple facts to consider, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Slavery was never popular here in Lower Marion. In the first place, farms of most landowners were comparatively small and could be worked by family and perhaps one or two. Uh, um, in the second place, many of the people uh, who settled Lower Marion were opposed to slavery on religious grounds. In the early days of the 18th century, Quakers permitted the practice of people who worked as house servants and were rented out to neighboring farms to work in the fields. Upon reflection, the Quakers uh, eventually opposed slavery on the belief that worldly gain should not have a part in the in enslaving of another human being. Here is Harrington House. Unfortunately, there's one exception to this general rule. <laughs> if you know the story of the Harrington House, uh, it was founded by um, Roland Ellis in 1704. By 1719, he ran into financial troubles. He sold his 700 acre farm to a Richard Harrison. He was a Quaker or an interloper from Maryland, namely not one of our local Quakers. And from 1719 to 1746, this plantation had up to 100 enslaved people uh, and was considered the northernmost tobacco plantation based on the southern slave economy in the colonies. Harrison ran into controversy with his fellow Quakers and Harrison was chastised not for owning enslaved people, um, but only too, too many. Today, the land is the plantation for, of the historic uh, Harrington House is also the, uh, where Beaumont Retirement Community is. It's also the site of the Harrington High School. Uh, this is our black eye for the community and it was only uh, Harrison and they said he moved out and the, and the next owner after that was a uh, uh, Charles Thompson who was the secretary to the Continental Congress. And if you have some time when this uh, place reopens, it's worth a trip to Harrington House and to meet Bruce Gill who's the executive director there and tell you the history of the um, Charles Thompson. Uh, it's a living history museum. On a more positive note, there was another Quaker named Joseph Price who had a, the holdings in what's today uh, Narvath and also include a large part of Wynwood. For 40 years, 1788 to about uh, 1828, Joseph kept his diary that recorded many local events. In his diary, we read uh, about his dislike for slavery. And I, we wrote about such topics as bearing, uh, buying freedom, burials, housing, and the great dislike for such an institution. He writes in his, uh, there's a Joseph Price marker, which is in front of the hamper shop on Montgomery Avenue. Uh, on the Norris side. He writes very eloquently in, in his entry on August 27th, 1805. He writes, a man that will keep his fellow creature in bondage is not fit for the Republic and badly corresponds with the American character. So this is the uh, historic market that was put out by the Historical Society. Joseph Price did not live there. That was the house that he built, but he was a quite a, uh, uh, I used the word Renaissance man. Uh, he was a Quaker farmer, innkeeper. He, he built a William Penn Inn, which he harbored runaway slaves. Um, he was undertaker, uh, diarist, sawmill operator. He put all the milestones along Lancaster Pike. A carpenter helped build a section of Lancaster Pike through Lower Marion, patriot and concerned citizen. Uh, he was a, we call a free Quaker. Uh, Quakers were anti-war. He did take up arms during the revolution and uh, help gain our freedom. So he was, he was a fighting Quaker. 
Uh, it's now uh, slavery becomes outlawed in Pennsylvania. Judge William Lewis, 1752 to 1819, was the U.S. District Judge in the District of Pennsylvania and the author of the 1780 Act of Gradual Abolitionism of Slavery. To appease slave owners, and the act gradually emancipated enslaved people, felt making slavery immediately illegal. This legislation was the first legal action towards the abolition of slavery in, in all the colonies. It happened around here. In fact, there's a connection between Judge Lewis and here in Lower Marion also. That's another talk. In 1785, the township assessment, um, there were 81 property owners, both Quaker and non-Quaker, and there were amongst this, all of Lower Marion, there's noted there were six enslaved people. Uh, they were owned by John Price, who owned one, a Daniel M. Briggs, innkeeper, he owned one, Robert Elliott Weaver owned one, and John Jones Farmer owned three. So we didn't have that many around. In 1792, Marion Friends Meeting declared its membership free from the taint of slave ownership. In general, the Quakers of the Lower Marion opposed slavery, but were not at all in agreement about the methods of, to address its evils. Their meetings took stances against the institution, but did not offer support on the methods of the, uh, what movement should be, uh, what action should be taken. There is another notable Quaker named Jacob Jones, who gave the, us the gift of the Lower Marion Academy. I find this guy special. Here's the uh, historic marker that's on the building. Uh, I'll just read a section of it. Quaker Jacob Jones bequeathed funds of nine acres of land to create the first school in Lower Marion dedicated in per per perpetuity to the education without regards to religion, race, and gender. 1812, how's that? That's the art of Lower Marion Academy. The uniquely Quaker approach to life was the Quaker seed is God in everyone. So everyone should be given certain re respect. Uh, what I find kind of scary, that's what the Quakers were doing. This is a, a school geography book. You can't see it very well, sorry about that. Uh, I have the book here. This is how history was taught, how you got along with people. This was, uh, we did not have this in Lower Marion. It was published in Philadelphia. And going around the circle here, uh, you have five stages of society, barbarous, savage, half civilized, civilized and engaged. Guess what the, uh, how they divide people up that way, by color of your skin. So they, they, they talk about the world is divided into white, yellow, red, brown, and black. And they will talk about the um, enlightened. Who are the enlightened people? A European or Caucasian is the most noble of the five races of men. It excels all others in learning and in the arts that includes the most powerful nations of ancient and modern times. The most valuable institutions of society and the most important and useful inventions have originated with the people of this race. So the whites are the good guys. So this is what was being taught in non-Quaker school. This is a geography textbook for children uh, published in Philadelphia. It's kind of scary to look at. So the school was for everybody, uh, free education. Um, also, you know, it was co-ed, the gender was a big deal. Then in 1842, um, and until 1914, to educate the adult community, the Academy trustees established a diverse and uncensored view of the world namely a library called the Lower Marion Literary Company. 
This remarkable library collection had more than 1400 books. Let me get my phone out of here. Let me adjust my screen. And as a sampling of some of the authors uh, that they had in this collection, um, instead of demonizing these other races, they said the way you add humanity to everything is to educate. So they, the Quakers were educating the children. The library was the education of the adults. In this collection, which I, as a librarian, I just adore, uh, it's an uncensored uh, library. Some of the books that were in there, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin in the Great Dismal Swamp. That is about the immoral and wicked institution of slavery. This was what was being taught, read in the academy. Charles Dickinson's collection of novels about the evils of the Industrial Revolution. George Catlin's letters and notes of the manners of the customs of the North American Indians. William Winston's work of Flavius Josephus, the learned and authentic Jewish historian and celebrated warrior. And finally, uh, another one I picked out to say how broad and spectrum it is, uh, the life of Mohammed, founder and a religion of Islam and the empire of the Saracens. So instead of demonizing them, they said, let's understand who they are, um, educate, appreciate who they are. Their God is in all these people. Then in 1877, located alongside the Lower Marion Academy building, the Academy trustees constructed and opened the Union Sunday School for use uh, by the community for non-denominational worship. We were a small farming community. The, the um, different religions in the area were not large enough to build their own churches. So this was a, a place the Union Sunday School that the people of various denominations could meet and worship uh, uh, and uh, gather and pray and sing. And it was also used for the education of the children who worked in local mills and factories. Uh, one of these local mills and factories, um, we were faced with child labor. Uh, this is a picture sketch of a William Clegg's mill. Uh, so one of these mills was, uh, it was a cotton mill. Uh, 1851 to 1908, uh, it was along the Schuylkill River. It's uh, when the uh, Kinwood Heritage Trail expands down the river. There's ruins down there of the Clegg's Mill. What's notable about that in the um, Clegg's Mill, they've employed 36 hands, 36 people. Eight were men, 10 were boys, 18 were girls. So it was child labor. And the Quakers were here to try to undo this. They had their Union Sunday School. So on their Sunday, their day off, the children would come up to the Union Sunday School and be uh, educated to learn to read and write. Um, it's God in it, it's God in everyone. Okay, <coughs> I'm gonna move on to Ardmore now. During the post-Civil War years, adding to the African-American community that was, that was located in South Ardmore, Freed Blacks from the South migrated here to, to work during the summer months at the Bryn Mawr Hotel Resort and at the other various local inns. This proud community settled around the uh, houses of worship, such as the Zion Baptist Church, 1894, and Mount Calvary Baptist Church, 1908. Uh, I got another recommended reading. If you want to know about the Black community in Lower Marion, I recommend, this is a thesis that was written uh, back in 1975. It's called Black Suburbanization of Philadelphia's Main Line. It's a dissertation um, by a Tricia, T-R-E-V-I-A, Pottinger. Hey, Jerry, can you slow down? Can you slow down for me, Black Suburbanization? Uh, on Philadelphia's Main Line, 1894, to 1975. So dissertation by Tricia, T-R-E-C-I-A, Pottinger. If you want to know about black history, here's 282 pages. <laughs> and, um, no, you can download, download this off the website. So we, we have a hard copy, of course, but you can go onto the website and search under her name and look. Uh, 
black <laughs> civilization, and her full dissertation will come down. Uh, the Historical Society's website? Uh, no, I just go to uh, Google. Ah. Something happened here. Thank you. But what's nice about what Tricia did, she was an undergraduate at Bryn Mawr College. And for four years, she used to come by every Wednesday night to the academy to do research, working up to her um, dissertation. And uh, I, we had a lot of information. Who was a great resource for her was Ted Goldsboro, who uh, took on her as a uh, special project to uh, guide her in the right direction. And, uh, there's very little written on black history. So a lot of what she did is uh, oral interviews. She was directed to in Ard Ardmore, South Ardmore, who to talk to, who to interview to get the family history. There's great, the black community has great family histories, but they don't, uh, they keep it to themselves. So she was, she did the interview. Currently, uh, Tricia is the Associate Dean of Academic Advising and Registrar at Oberlin College. So she did, yeah, she's African-American, by the way. Um, highly recommended if you want to understand black history. And it's what's nice is jury because it's not what she wrote. People write papers and sometimes they're just, their biases are in there. It's wrong. You, they, you can't recommend them, but this is a good one. Okay. Uh, now we arrival of the railroads and new industry. This, the locomotive, no, 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 no. <laughs> The locomotive now replaces the Schuylkill River waterway and our wagon roads as the primary mode of transportation. Uh, we are now entering the railroad era as, uh, um, as an example. The Philadelphia Columbia Railroad, uh, 1834 to 1857, passed through our community and was considered part of the Underground Railroad. Traveling by rail from Columbia, Pennsylvania, that is located along the Susquehanna River and not far the Mason, from the Mason-Dixon line, all the way to the city of Philadelphia. It stretched for 82 miles and was an eight to nine hour trip. When the train got near the Belmont Plateau, which is also called the Inclined Plain, the runaway enslaved Africans would be directed to disembark and cross over the Schuylkill River at Peters Island. Um, it's just a short distance upriver from the Columbia Avenue Railroad Bridge. Uh, and then up to Germantown Avenue and onto Johnson's house that would provide refuge and a safe haven for them. This is a marker that's uh, outside of the Marion Media. It talks about the Philadelphia Columbia Railway. It is a, um, this railroad was a major route for escaping slaves crossing the Susquehanna River from Maryland. As freight cars passed this meeting, several Quaker families who operated safe houses placed food and water in the cars for the passing. <coughs> Uh, uh, anyways, uh, aiding and abetting this, it was uh, dangerous if you got caught. Uh, this was a, um, it was something called the Fugitive Slave Act from 1793 and later revised in 1850 and made much harsher penalties. Um, so it had to remain a clandestine uh, activity because uh, if you harbored or run away, this was an act of civil disobedience and therefore a punishable offense. Then in 1857, the state of Pennsylvania decided to get out of the railroad business and sold lock, stock and barrel to an up, up and coming railroad called the Pennsylvania Railroad. This became our main line system. Eight of the 14 presidents of the Pennsylvania Railroad lived here in Lower Marion. One of these was the seventh president, Alexander J. Cassatt, 1899 to 1906 when he was president, visionary founder and architect of the prestigious mainline. I love this image of the holiday magazine cover. Um, what's over us in the cloud is the Pennsylvania Railroad locomotive and cars and beneath us is very recognizable landscape of, of uh, the main line with the, uh, in the distance with the high, high buildings, but uh, you can see Bryn Mawr College, all the other national landmarks there. Uh, it was the uh, uh, good place to live. During the post-Civil War 
era, we transitioned into a premier suburban community of the rich and the, uh, rich men in their castles. For the upper class retailers and industrious, industrialists in Philadelphia. The peak, the bookends for this was 1875 to about 1930. Uh, they built this whole community um, in time for the centennial and it lasted to about 1930. Uh, what happened there was the uh, Great Depression. Uh, a lot of things happened from, from 1930, it was on decline. The main line stretched out along the Pennsylvania Railroad Western commuter line from Overbrook train station all the way to um, Paoli. The focal point was the Bryn Mawr train station. These country houses were, and sprawling estates, numbered more than 150 properties. Uh, and it was the destination for affluent white Protestant Philadelphians. A company of these estates were private schools, exclusive clubs, polo fields, sports activities, fox hunting, street skeet shooting, horseshoes, horse shows, cricket clubs, uh, etc. The Cassatt even went as far to rename all our villages, our communities, giving them Welsh names. Um, Jones's Crossing became Wynwood. Uh, my favorite is um, Humphreysville became Bryn Mawr. Uh, there's one exception to that, and that's uh, Athensville. Uh, after uh, protests from the large Irish population in Athensville, uh, it, it, they didn't want a Welsh name. It became known as Ardmore, a name for a small town uh, in Ireland along the Atlantic coast. Okay, speaking of the Irish and now, let's focus on the attention and all about the Italians and the Irish. How did they get here? There's a need for workforce labor in these huge country estates. Therefore, in the 1870s, Alexander de Sot made a mutually beneficial agreement with the Roman Catholic Archbishop James Wood of Philadelphia to raise immigration quotas for, for these two ethnic groups, the Italians and the Irish. The first to arrive were the Italians who were employed as stone cutters and landscapes, architects. Many of this group were organized into trade unions and after their work was completed, they returned home to Italy. Those that remained uh, settled around mostly Narberth and Devon areas. The next wave of immigrants included the Irish who were to work as domestic help and as housemaids in the, and coatsmen in the mansions. The Irish decided to stay and to settle, and to settle here. And part of their work agreement, uh, they were supposed to keep, um, keep them honest, to, in order to keep them honest and God-fearing, uh, they had to attend uh, Sunday church services uh, on a regular basis. Uh, our Mother Good Council was founded in 1896, I'm sorry, 1885 in Bryn Mawr, in Bryn Mawr and St. Coleman's in 1906, an Ardmore was founded and served as for that purpose. And there's the all too familiar NINA at this time, no Irish need apply. It was frequently displayed in store windows and classified advertisements. We are truly at this time a divided community. When the Pennsylvania Railroad tracks as the visible dividing line, the most affluent population lived on the north side of the railroad tracks, while the working class and, and poor lived on the south side of the tracks, the colored, the Irish, the Italians, and the Germans. I'm gonna tell you the story about the, um, or lady of the railroad tracks. I love little sidebars that just kind of make human interest. The north side was the affluent, the south side was, was included the Irish, Again, uh, dividing line was the railroad tracks. Um, back in 1889, the Irish bought a small piece of land on the north side uh, of the tracks, and they, with their goal to uh, build their church there. But after um, the transaction was uh, completed, they found out it came with some um, conditions that within three years they had to build a large stone church and had to be uh, um, active and practicing. They could not uh, afford that. So what they did was um, their little wooden chapel, which they had built, they jacked up and took it across the Pinswood Bridge to the 
sounds like. They ran into trouble. Halfway across the bridge, the, uh, they couldn't get underneath the telegraph wires, um, <laughs> which were hanging too low. So while the, uh, the making arrangements with the Pennsylvania Railroad, which took a couple of weeks to re redirect the telegraph wires to, instead of over the bridge to under the bridge, uh, every, every day, every Sunday morning and every day, the Catholic priest would offer mass on the bridge. That's why I call it Our Lady of the Railroad Tracks. Uh, until the wires were moved and they could continue their journey to where our mother of good counsel is today. So uh, what happened here, the Italians got exiled to the southern side. Little side story. In 1900, Alexander Cassatt was now supervisor for the township of Lower Marion, namely a rural township limited ability to levy taxes. Lobbied Harrisburg to the legislature to create a township of the first class. Laura Mary became a first municipality in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, um, uh, being uh, namely managed by a board of commissioners with a broader ability to levy taxes. The township was now uh, the authority to effect change for the common good. Due to the efforts of Alexander Cassatt and a newly constituted board of directors, uh, took charge of the situation and began the gentrification of the township. For example, in 1910, the uh, commissioners, uh, Board of Commissioners, uh, we received a report of survey of the mainline district prepared by the Committee of Investigation of the Board of Health. Did you know that they identified that they were slums? They used the word slums and they had pictures how um, in, in Ardmore, Haverford, Bryn Mawr, Rosemont, and Wayne uh, that were characterized as having health hazards as open sewers, open piles of manure, poor and crowded housing conditions. So these people were the workers living around the large mansions and they couldn't, they were just, they went and lived close to work. Uh, they had terrible uh, living conditions. Uh, these rundown population areas were located in and around the country houses where many of the day laborers and estates were employed. Uh, the report quotes, in all inequality of society, there is indifference and neglect for the, of the suffering of our neighbors. So the commissioners decided we have to do something about this. In 1919, uh, according to the mainline uh, district city planning report prepared by the mainline citizens association for Laura Marion to the township commissioners, it was written by Frederick Law Homestead. Homestead was a noted city planner and landscaper architect who drafted a plan, a vision for a new Lower Marion. Part of this vision was adopted, much of it was upon uh, at the time of being much too expensive. This is now 1919. I would like to briefly mention another related topic. In 1919, there was also another issue and that was women's rights. It was the 19th Amendment was ratified uh, thank you to all the suffragettes. Um, there's still the unfinished business of the Equal Rights Amendment that needs to be done. Now back to the township's gentrification efforts. Um, it, all around these beautiful mansions, there were slums. In 1927, they, to hide and, and repair our slums, the uh, approach shifted to zoning issues. Uh, uh, so came the township zoning code. In 1937, a plan for the Lower Marion Township prepared a planning commission of, in a, for the Lower Marion Township. And this was the considered the first comprehensive plan for the township. <clears throat> so over time, the, it, all this got cleaned up. It became more healthy. You got rid of the eyesores. Uh, Coulter Avenue in Suburban Square, it, now it's all gentrified, but it used to be, a, that was a slum area. Um, next came the automobile revolution. In Ardmore, a very good thing happened. The appearance of industry along with many good jobs. Okay, the, uh, the auto car company. This is a marker that's on Montgomery, on Lancaster Avenue in front of Mapes, a former site of the auto car company. The auto car company uh, founded by the Clark brothers was one of the early pioneers in manufacturing cars and trucks. For more than 50 years, its factory was the center of activity that was located between Lancaster Avenue and the railroad tracks in downtown Ardmore. This is what the factory, oops, wrong button. This is what the factory looked like. It was um, um, 
I always find it interesting, Audemars, Audemars is a historic district. It was a factory town. <laughs> Once they left, it became <laughs> more gentrified. At the time, Autocar and the township was the largest employer. It was an important political as well as special presence and was responsible for the blending of various racial and ethnic groups in, in, of the middle and lower classes. Living primarily in South Ardmore, these factory workers were both white and black, both men and women, who learned a trade that gave them the ability to buy their own home, send their children to school, etc. And the industry did not create untold wealth for the leaders as a railroad. Uh, Autocar was much more of a middle class and a working class company. Okay, let's talk about mm -hmm. racial, racial division. We're getting there. How are you doing? Due to the recent news concerning the anti-Asian violence, I decided to include this as a sidebar in our history story. This talks about the Marion Memorial Park. It's located just across the street and down the hill from the Lower Marion Academy. Organized in 1884, this 31 acre Chinese, um, this 31 acre cemetery that serves the African American community and the Chinese community in Philadelphia. Here's a picture of the Chinese section. Um, so here's an opportunity to become familiar with some of our Chinese neighbors. You're, are you aware of this hidden historical artifact of the past? Families that were predominantly from Chinatown in downtown Philadelphia wanted to ensure a respectful burial for their loved ones. Uh, located, um, there's a Chinese section that you can see uh, located amongst the grove of trees. You can see such objects as the, uh, in the Chinese section, of the, uh, there were the burial plots that were rented, while others were sold. In addition, there were open fire pits, altars, and shrines for their family to make traditional offerings, which usually included a meal and an occasional smoke for the deceased. Uh, from 1900 to 1937, um, the Chinese had the practice to have a temporary burial when the family had uh, deceased and raised the necessary funds to return the body. To China, the body would be exhumed, uh, disinterred, and the bones would be cleaned and carefully boxed and for the trip back to China. When the communist government took control of the mainline, mainland China, bodies of the deceased could not be returned and the practice of disinterment ended. It's a wonderful little, uh, you can see here the, the uh, open fire pits, the altars, things like that. Uh, it's, it's kind of a abandoned right now, but it's a, a nice history of the presence of the Chinese. Now back to my main story, adding to the racial tensions, there was the presence of the Ku Klux Klan, founded in 1865, mostly in the South, and revised again around 1915, up here in the South and in the North. The KKK was a, an American white supremacist hate group that was anti-Black, anti-Irish, anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, and anti-anti. At the end of the 20th century, some of our village communities had recruitment centers and well-publicized and well-organized clans here in Lower Marion. They focused their attention on intimidation, mass marches, such as on Memorial Day and the July 4th holidays. Uh, displaying the Christian flag and, the, and then the, uh, there was the old familiar prospering. Here's a quote from one of the newspapers about one of the rallies. It was quite a group. They marched three abreast, 12 to or 15 rows of them. It was not a secret that the Klan was planning to march in Lower Marion the same night. This is an interesting story. This is the KK Klan visits uh, Harford College. Well, on the evening of July 3rd, 1924, the eve of uh, July 4th, mind you, 200 Klans, Klansmen rallied on hill overlooking the black and Italian neighborhood uh, uh, and set a large cross ablaze. During this melee, um, a Lower Marion officer was shot and eventually died. 
uh, made the papers. Uh, unfortunately, when the, the Klansmen scattered uh, after the shots were fired, and but no one was arrested or apprehended. And I think the, uh, by the way, I think Bryn Mawr College, I'm sorry, Haverford College Quakers, being a Quaker school, was really upset that the KKK would, was bold enough to do such a hateful uh, act on their property. In 2012, local officials honored the slain police officer, Francis A, sorry, Francis X Roy, with a plaque and remarks that as a time, that, that at, at a time that was bleak and embarrassing in our history, he went forward and did his job and paid with the, his ultimate price. So there was a large presence of KKK in our area. Um, then let's talk about public education. This is the Ardmore Avenue School. There's a plaque there that was put out. Uh, there it is by uh, it's a joint plaque between the Lower Marion Township and the Lower Marion School District. And there was a, a support and help of uh, research from the Lower Marion Historical Society. The marker says it all. Uh, I dare you to read the marker. If, I've never seen a marker that has so many words. It's located on Ardmore Avenue next to the Masonic Temple, which is basically across the street from St. Mary's uh, there. But this, the, this plaque says it all. The site of the Ardmore Avenue School, built in 1875, demolished in 1965. Ardmore Avenue School was, was the core of the predominantly African American, American South Ardmore community. It was one of the early elementary schools built by Lower Marion School District and for 16 years was also the Lower Marion High School. During the 1960s civil rights movement, it was argued that the education of the students was separate and unequal. And as part of this desegregation plan, the school district closed it in August, 1963 and assigned 223 students uh, to four uh, other elementary schools. So this is something recent, 223. It is a marker. Uh, I hope you find it along the road, but it's, uh, it, it's, um, <coughs> there's more to the story, but I can't tell all the story. I don't have the time. I'm running out of time, but this is a place to start. What, uh, this is where the desegregation started here in Lower Mary. Uh, ethnic diversity, I'm getting almost done. It was a uh, small Jewish presence in the early years in the city of Philadelphia that dates back before, before the arrival of William Penn in 1682. Many of these Jews were part of the merchant class of people. At the close of the War of Independence, the Jewish population of Philadelphia amounted to more than 500 people. Recommended reading. <laughs> I always, I read this book. It's um, the history of the Jews of Philadelphia from Colonial Times to the Age of J uh, Jackson by Edwin Wolf II and Maxwell Whitman. Uh, will you have it? Hey, Jerry, can, Jerry, can you say that again? Or just hold it up, I'll type. Just hold it up, I'll type. The History of the Jews of Philadelphia from Colonial Times to the Age of Jackson by Edwin Wolf II and Maxwell Whitman. You speak much faster than I type. Just hold the title up for me. I'll type it. There you go. Thank you. Uh, published in 1956 by the Jewish Publication Society. Uh, Edwin and the name, the author, Edwin uh, Wolf II. Yes, W O L F the second and Maxwell Whitman W H I T E M A N. Um, it's all about the Jewish, I mean, I'm a librarian. I have to, every time I give a talk, I have to have recommended reading. <laughs> it comes with the DNA, it comes with the jury. Okay. 
Philadelphia was a large metropolitan city and Lower Marion was a rural farming community separated only by the Schuylkill River. It is difficult to pin down the exact date when Jewish peddlers first arrived in Lower Marion. It is likely that traveling merchants based in Philadelphia were already on the scene by the 18th century. As transportation improved by the early turnpike and railroads uh, of the 18th century, more Jews, Jewish peddlers established regular routes in the township. So here's another opportunity to become aware of some of our, our Jewish neighbors. Are you aware of this hidden historical artifact of our past? The Horace Team Cemetery. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. I, hopefully you have. Uh, lost but not forgotten. It's six acres. It's located on Graves Lane off Conshohocken State Road in Gladwin. Uh, it, uh, it dates back to 1893 and was a place to provide a dignified burial according to Jewish law. The cemetery has, uh, um, has been inactive since 19, seven, 1945. Uh, geographically, it's located halfway between and serviced the Philadelphia and Norristown Jewish communities. Recently, the Beth David Reform Congregation has adopted this site uh, and it's being taken care of by the Friends of Gladman Jewish Memorial Cemetery. All these hidden treasures that you find out there. <coughs> in 1884, the emigration of the Harrison family from Louisiana signaled the arrival of the Jews into Lower Marion. The Harrisons were one of the oldest and most prominent merchant families in Ardmore. Uh, specializing in general merchandise and clothing. From 1891 to 2003, the Harrison department store was a prominent destination that was located on the main street of Lancaster Avenue. Devoted to their faith, the Jews worshiped <coughs> in their homes until about 1936 uh, with a mainline Hebrew association was chartered uh, with the mission of to worship almighty God according to the doctrines, creed, and customs of the Hebraic faith. Okay, today's, uh, we have uh, people of the Jewish faith here. Today is called the Marion Park Community, uh, located along Meeting House Lane. It was an example of racial and possibly, we don't know, ethnic discrimination. It was called Marion Park Housing Development and was gradually built and uh, start, started being built in 1924 by Martin Maloney. In his homeowners association agreement, he says this 72 acre community is thoroughly protected by permanent restrictions that effectively prevent your property from loss or value. In, the, in, the, in this covenant, um, the 11th article states, lots of ground shall at no time hereafter forever be occupied by any person or persons other than members of the Caucasian race. So we talk about this at the Historical Society. What do you mean in 1924 by Caucasian? Uh, so what did the use of the term Caucasian? Did it really mean to represent, uh, what was the vocabulary back? Did that also mean to exclude Jews? Don't know. I, th I think it might have. In our library collection, there is no evidence that the practice of redlining occurred here in Lower Marion. But an absence of evidence is not an absence of fact. And there seems to be some verbal evidence that there was a more subtle form of discrimination where, uh, where it was generally understood not to sell to the people of Jewish faith. I'm sure some of you have experienced some of this on the, the more subtle. Um, love to hear hear your stories. Uh, as of 2010, Lower Marion had a population of more than 59,000 individuals with a local makeup of 85.7% were white, large. 6% uh, were Asian, 5.6% were black or African American. 3% of the population were Hispanic or Latino and 1.9% uh, were two, uh, two or more races. <coughs> in the future, what might be the shift of, in population because of the wave of the many new apartments and condominiums that are being built in our area? 
there seems to be a shortage of affordable housing uh, here in Lower Marion. Uh, something not to forget. Uh, there's opportunities here, especially in South Warrenmore, where there's a gentrification is occurring and where the black community is getting squeezed out. In 2009, the Lower Marion Academy opened its doors and became a meeting place for some township leaders and members of the LGBTQ community. They gathered to draft the new ordinance and that authorized the creation of a Township Human Relations Commission. That evening when I left the Academy, I turned around and looked back and saw the rainbow flag on display from the Academy. And I thought to myself, I think Jacob Jones would be happy to see this. I don't think he would understand it, but I think he would be happy. He's the one that gave us the Academy. Uh, the Lower Marion Human Relations uh, Commission enabling legislation that was approved uh, the next year in 2010. Okay, I'm into my conclusion. <laughs> in conclusion, I admit that this brief history is far from being complete and there is much more that needs to be revealed. I pray and hope that there are other opportunities to, to add to this unfinished story. This can be used as a starting point to any further investigation. We are a multicultural democracy, and I believe that our United States of America gets an overall grade of excellent for the land of new opportunities. But because of our rapid growth and the history of violence, we miss the mark in certain social justice issues, such as the genocide that our indigenous people experience and on our insensitivity when dealing with the spectrum of various minority populations. We're an ever evolving community and I can't predict what our future will be, but I am hopeful of a better future. It's understood our past and we adhere to the legacy that our ancestors left us. We must continue to learn to live in peace to better understand and appreciate our fellow human beings. We have a Lenape legacy. So it's uh, interesting what it is. Again, they were here for 12,000 years. They were really <laughs> major. <laughs> um, I think their legacy is climate change. They were had a nature religion. Our, this is from their uh, folk tales book, a Lenape people. Our belief is to keep the earth and life in all proper balance and in harmony. Each generation is here, but a little while. And while we are alive, it is our responsibility to see that the land remains pure and undefiled so that our future generations may continue to live here in health and in happiness. What we do to the land, to the earth, we do to ourselves and to those of the, the future generations yet unborn. Okay, last slide. What is the Quaker legacy? I think it's a quote from William Penn. He said, let us try what love will do. Um, this is a picture of the peaceful kingdom. Uh, when we published our book, The First 300, uh, Dick Jones was the editor and his, he had to come up with what, what should go on the cover. What represents Lower Marion best, just in the, uh, graphically. And he came up with this uh, um, Edward Hicks, Peaceable Kingdom. Um, around the border, it's a um, quote from Isaiah. Uh, it says, the wolf shall also dwell and the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and the little child shall lead them. So I think that's a, the, uh, what the Quakers give to us. Uh, we should just be patient, it's God in every one of us, and we have a lot to do. And I think if uh, a generation from now, they look back what we did today, they'll find a lot, a lot of things wrong. So there'll be lectures about that, but uh, please keep trying. Uh, this is the end of my story, but uh, it's just the beginning of our conversation. Okay, thank you for uh, your great, great patience. All right, Jerry, thank you so much. So first, before we, get into the Q&A, two things. Number one, I inadvertently um, deactivated the chat, so I apologize halfway through the call. 
Um, if you've been trying to chat, hopefully you can either either it catch, catches up or you can put your chat in again. That was my bad. I apologize. Number two, Jerry, the first book that you mentioned. Yes. Um, the book title and the author, please. Okay. Brand new book. It's only been out for a short time. Uh, you can just hold it up, Jerry. If you oh. just hold up the screen so I can cite it. Thanks. To understand that you really have to understand the Lenape. Um, we have a lot of artifacts from the Lenape at the Historical Society that date back 12,000 years. They were, you know, uh, tools they used, things like that. So there were people here, but they, they didn't have, they were just travelers through the area. They didn't have any, they didn't settle in the villages. It wasn't until the uh, Woodlands period they settled down and became known as Lenape. And then the, this is the contact period when things got really messed up. Uh, the Lenape was the, uh, the female was the, um, <laughs> important person in the community. Uh, suddenly the European comes and they're, they're not interested in the uh, listening to the female. Uh, so it's uh, as one of the many things that were uh, uh, caused problems. All right, um, excellent, thank you. Um, Sorry, I went too long. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to first go back. No, no, uh, so hold on a second. Let me, let me catch the participant number, no. We started at like 113. You still got 100. So your <laughs> audience hung on. Not too many away. And and you had you actually had 112 when you started signing off. So that you you definitely held your audience. Nicely done. All right, I'm going to roll back and see if there's any questions in the chat history. Uh, one question. And this is about, I think this came in the context of, and by the way, I wrote this down. I like to use little pithy quotes at work. Um, among them, the data, you know, data is not the plural of an anecdote. And your absence of evidence is not absence of fact. I wrote that down. That's a good one. I'm holding on to that. So I think this was in the context of the maybe the first Jews could have come here. And oh, okay. you mentioned then it was it was Benjamin somebody and wasn't clear, but the absence of evidence we, is not an absence of fact. We have, so we had a question. So the question was, would they have been Moranos? I'm and I'm not entirely qualified to answer what a Murano is. I'm assuming assuming something like a Sephardic. Yeah, they were Sephardic. Janet? Yes. Janet, help me out. There were Sephardic Jews from Portugal that escaped the Inquisition. Um, they came to, to the Barbados and they worked their way up here. Not a bad guess for an Irish Catholic kid. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 we have, um, you know, evidence that they were here. Um, uh, and, you know, no, this is 1655. I mean, who was keeping records? There's no Philadelphia Inquirer to report on what was going on. Most people could not read or write, uh, but there is a, a trace that the, uh, what was, um, what is today Montgomery Avenue was called the Allegheny Path back then. Uh, it was the Native Americans used it from the, basically what is today Philadelphia to the Allegheny Mountains. Uh, and it was a trading path. So along that path, there was the Swedes set up a trading post. So <coughs> the local population could bring in their, their uh, furs, um, et cetera. And it seems to be that there's some evidence that these two gentlemen were around at that time and uh, were possibly visited the area. But they were, they were uh, fur traders around here. That we had, that, uh, there was a Jewish presence, yes. Uh, 27 years before William Penn. <laughs> Unbelievable. All right. Um, this is not a question. It's on that one, you know. All right. Sorry, Jerry, don't mean to speak over you. Um, this is not a question. It's some feedback. Just a comment rather than weak immune system referring to native populations, 
it might be better to say their immune system had not previously seen these diseases, okay. and thus they were more susceptible. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Looking, you know, there's talk, uh, you know, uh, about the Lenape in the Mid Atlantic region, not around here, mostly in northern uh, New Jersey. Uh, this is these. Uh, uh, the pandemic, the uh, diseases, they would, some of the Europeans would enter a village and there would be nobody there. Everyone would, everyone would be deceased. There's no one alive to bury the deceased. That's how this pandemic wiped them out. Um, it's sad. Th that part is okay. really Next. unavoidable, but the uh, smallpox is avoidable. All right, next question from Vivian. Did I hear correctly the black community, the black community in Ardmore grew around Service, serve, service of the Bryn Mawr Hotel. Uh, pretty much with, with the um, post Civil War, uh, they were a lot of the um, freed African Americans came up here because they had relatives, etc. And they were hired basically to work in the. Uh, it's a seasonal thing to work in the kitchens, uh, etc. At the Bryn Mawr Hotel, and there were other inns around, so it was a seasonal business. Uh, so at least they had that employment. And I got that information. Uh, um, when we wrote our book, The First 300, An Amazing and Rich History of Laura Marion, uh, we asked each community to write their history. And the Blacks are, are sh I would say, shy. So I had, we ended up doing a lot of interviewing. Uh, they have a wonderful history, but they just don't want to, they're not as open. That's why Tricia Pod Pottinger was wonderful. She took the time, interviewed all these people. And uh, being an African American, they were more open to her. Uh, I never like to give a lecture about uh, other ethnic people. <coughs> I will not give a history, you know, about, uh, uh, let's say, talk about history of the black community. I'm not black. I don't know what it was like. I have no idea. I can do it for the Lenape because there's no voice here for them at all. And I'm, I'm well guided and uh, directed by Dr. Marshall Pecker. Okay, next question. What happened to the people who lived in those cleaned up areas? And I'm guessing that that referred, given the time period that it came up, it referred to how Ardmore was gentrified. But if I get that wrong, yeah, the it, question it, it asker. They had pictures of what the slums looked like. I mean, this was uh, around 1900. It was before the automobile. So it was animal manure all over the place. The, how do you store it? The sewers, the sewers had not been. <laughs> but they, someone has to, we would, we would love to, maybe our next lecture or something, write the history of the auto car. That's what changed it. There's suddenly um, this business came along, um, hired African-American whites, women, men working side by side. It was a very progressive, uh, the Clark's brothers were very progressive in their uh, employment. So these people learned to trade and they were able to uh, buy their own homes and uh, educate their children, et cetera, et cetera. That was the big change is auto car. All right. That question was asked by Adrian. Adrian, if I got your question wrong, can you please just clarify it in the chat and I'll get to it. Thanks. And if you, to everyone who's participating, if you're not reading the chat, I really recommend you go down, mouse down to the bottom of your screen, click the chat, open it up. There's a lot of people offering, you know, interesting anecdotes, um, fact points that I won't read out loud, but um, there's some good stuff there. Sure. And lots of very positive feedback, Jerry. Especially with the uh, discrimination question, selling to Jewish people. Um, again, it was kind of a uh, behind the back. And uh, uh, I can't say well, it. Actually, nothing's in writing. Actually, I laughed, at, I laughed at that because that came from one of our contributors, Effie, who used to be my neighbor. So neither one of us could have owned the houses that we owned <laughs> back in the day. But anyhow, here's a question for you. From Peter, when did black families first form a community in South Ardmore? Well, they were always there uh, for the working class um, in the um, 
they basically arrived when the uh, the Gilded Age, when all the mansions came along. They needed people to work in the you know, uh, to work in the, in the mansions and things like that, in the, la in the laundry. Uh, and so they lived on the, in the south side of the tracks, Wilson's Laundry. That's this kind of businesses that were there to support the uh, the mansions. So they were always there. It was supplemented post Civil War uh, when there was uh, you know more people arrived there. All right, thank you. Um, question from Janet. What were the dates on the Chinese cemetery on the main line? Uh, Chinese cemetery on the main line. Give me a second. <laughs> I have to go look it up. Oh man, there's a whole slew of people explaining to me what a Murano is. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me. <laughs> Oh, uh, no. I'm looking for the questions. Uh, here, relative to the same topic, what is the location of the Chinese cemetery? Where's the location? It's, um, if, you, if, you, if you start at the Lower Marion Academy or the Ballacumid Middle School and go down the hill on Bryn Mawr Avenue, it goes slightly down the hill, and you'll see a, a plaque there that says Marion Memorial Park Cemetery. You go through that gate, you're at, it's, it's uh, it's a hill. Uh, at the top of the hill is mostly African American. You go down to the bottom of the hill in the back uh, that borders on Conshohocken State Road. That's where the uh, Chinese section of the cemetery is. Um, uh, and it's, it's just that the, the headstones are just more little pillars. It's kind of um, kind of quaint. Uh, the, the grove of trees and this is where they would bring food and the uh, so a lot of cultures have that tradition, uh, you know, uh, uh, they bring food to your ancestors. And then they had the uh, open fire pits, which is still there, but now there's a big sign, you don't, can't burn here. <laughs> um, and cook the meals all and right. offer it to the- uh, uh, That's great, Jerry, thanks. Um, next question from Karen. Was Narberth the property that the Irish bought? Most of it is on the north side of the track. What's the question again? It was Narberth. <clears throat> was Narberth the okay. property that the Irish bought? Most of it is on the north side of the track. Well, when I talk about the north south, that's out in Bryn Mawr, um, Haverford, further west, not not down in the Narberth area. Okay. So uh, it's and the, here's a clarifying question. Here's a clarifying question. Another question: When you say the tracks. Which railroad are we talking about? The one that used to run along Montgomery Avenue? Yes. No, the, uh, it's the Pennsylvania Railroad, the one that's there to pay only local today. So basically from um, just beyond Norbeth out further uh, through Haverford, Bryn Mawr, uh, et cetera, it was the north side and the south side. And if you look at a uh, Atlas map, you'll see big estates, uh, stone castles, uh, all the churches and schools, like Bryn Mawr College, are made out of stone. And on the south side is all the uh, service industries, uh, mostly. You know. All right. Okay, so that's the end of the questions, unless I've missed one. Um, apparently, I've just been corrected. So, so I saw statements. I didn't see an actual question about this, but I'll ask the question because it's now framed as a question. You skipped the question about if Harriton High School was named after a slave owner, question mark. Yes. Mr. Harrison, okay. um, uh, which uh, owned the Harriton Plantation. Uh, I remember years ago when Dr. S uh, Savadoff was the superintendent of school and I was meeting with him negotiating the uh, Lower Marion Academy lease. And he says, don't tell anyone Harrington High School is a part of a slave plantation. <laughs> we named it after a slave plantation. That was a bad idea. <laughs> so anyway, it's right. just- uh, Thank you, it, Lisa. It is uh, public knowledge. In our first, our book, The First 300, uh, we talk about it. Uh, uh, Bruce Gill talks about it on his tour. It's a uh, black eye for the community. Uh, but again, I look at it, it was a uh, Quaker interloper from Maryland that did this, it was one of our local guys. <laughs> All right, so we're not done with this topic yet. Yeah, there's a comment um, here from Cynthia Saltzman saying, Leslie, the son-in-law 
of the slave owner at Harriton House was an abolitionist. The history is more complicated than Harriton High being named after a slave owner. So another comment. Uh, slavery is very complicated perspective. Um, I'm not going there. <laughs> uh, that, that's, that's another whole lecture onto itself. You would have to get involved with. Um, well, actually, just in respect for Cynthia, I will, I'll read out what she says. No, my understanding is that Harriton House's ancestor who took over the land was an important abolish, abolitionist and got rid of the slaves. So, clearly a topic of debate. Charles Thompson um, who inherited it from Mr. Harrison. He's the one that changed it and got rid of all the slaves. The next owner. Would you, would you actually say that? Could you say that again? Because I uh, there were basically three major owners. The first was uh, um, I forget what's the first owner. Uh, then then it went to Mr. Harrison. He was there for a while. When he he left, uh, uh, Charles Thompson came in and shut it down as a um, uh, tobacco farm. They could, it was a tobacco plantation and got rid of all the slaves. Uh, uh, Charles Thompson was, a, I think, a Presbyterian. Uh, he was a, a, a secretary to the Continental Congress, well-educated, and he just would have nothing to do with the uh, um, slavery. Okay, so I think that goes, that speaks to your point that it's nuanced and complicated. Yes. And potentially both, both statements are true. It may have been owned by a slave owner and then subsequently owned by someone who freed the slaves. Mm -hmm. that were on that plantation. Um, from Peter, question comes, quote unquote, got rid of the slaves. He's quoting you, Jerry. <laughs> Do you mean freed them? Do you mean uh, freed them or know. transported them yeah. south or sold them or what? That I don't know. I don't know that level of detail. I think you should uh, uh, visit Harriton House, uh, historic Harriton House. It is a national landmark. Talk to Bruce Gill. Uh, he is a scholar. In all this and a good friend of ours he's also on our board of directors at the historical society he would give you uh, a much more detailed answer uh, than, than i i would um, besides the house is also the cemetery which is nearby which tells a whole different story um, so it, it is complicated history is very swampy i, I love these things yep. <clears throat> there's no no okay no. Um, unless unless i get overruled by gene or janet um, there's a couple additional comments in the chat on this, and it's clearly a topic that has engaged people, and it's an important topic, and I'm not trying to shut down the conversation in any way possible, but I think, Jerry, your answer is actually quite instructive and useful, that go there, go to the Harriton House, inspect the history, come to your own conclusions. Mm -hmm. So, Janet? Besides the, Martin House, there's a, oh, okay, there's the cemetery, but it's, it's, it's landlocked, you can't get to it, but that's, it tells, uh, that's part of the story also. But I'm sure Mr. Mr. Bruce Gill can tell you this, what, what's happening there. And we have pictures of it on our website, who's buried there, et cetera. So Michael. Janet, can I hand it back over to you? Sure, sure. I just want to, on behalf of the Board of the Library and all of the listeners, I want to thank Jerry Francis once again for an incredibly engaging, instructive, fascinating history of these aspects of our township. Um, I always learn a tremendous amount listening to you. It, um, the Historical Society, I think, is a uh, place that many of us would like to visit once things reopen. And now Harriton House goes on to the list to try to get all of our questions answered. Really appreciate you. You're a treasure for our community. And thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you uh, and any future areas that you decide to research. I will be around. Thank I would love you. to come over and uh, see the, our Quaker library. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And 
uh, just as a reminder to our viewers that the Valley Kinwood Library and other libraries in our system all need your support. And we think that they are the pillars of the community. They bring all of our communities together and they're one of the most important institutions you'll ever visit. We're delighted that they're open now in person. And uh, if an anyone doesn't know, you actually can go to the library now. They've been open for a couple of weeks. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, we'll look forward to future lectures. Okay. God bless you all. Okay, with that, we're ending our session for tonight. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Jerry. Good night. Thank you, Thank you for having me.